Susie and Charles. I, Robin keeps me updated on what goes on with her, and it's just amazing. It, it's amazing uh, and what she's telling me, how the progress that George's going. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, show, it's short steps, but it's in the right direction. And uh, the Lord is definitely answering prayer. And uh, their family wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that they got a GoFundMe page set up. And and now have an account, they have an account at the Ferguson Federal Credit Union for the ones that want to uh, donate uh, to the family. And any cards or letters or whatever, you can mail it to the address here at uh, 2180 Hurricane Lake Drive. Or you can probably give them to her grandmother sitting over here, and she will give them to her. But... Uh, I was talking with uh, Keith this morning, uh, Turpin, Miss Leslie Pearl. They tested her positive for uh, Corona, but then they retested her and it came back negative. You know, so that's a praise right there. You know, so uh, the Lord is definitely, definitely still in the answering prayers. And during all of this and the anxiety and the uncertainty, and just all the chaos that's going on, the numbers are going up. You know, we hear you know, a thousand and then all of this. Just continue to continue to lift up the ones that we know that are sick. You know, continue to lift them up. Continue to pray for our country. Continue to pray for our president, vice president. You know, the Lord is listening. And the Lord does love us and care for us. So please, please go to him in prayer. I got a... Uh, seen Scott this morning. He got a good report. They was able to uh, diagnose uh, what uh, has been going on with him. So they got him on medication, and I told him this morning he looks a whole lot better. He, he looks he looks a lot better. His color is great, and so we're definitely praising the Lord and thanking Him for that. So anybody else have any other announcements that we need to make? Okay, we have a special guest this morning, Miss Katie Claire Smith.
Just suppose God searched through heaven. He couldn't find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed. That would buy eternal life for you and me. And had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. But I'm so glad he was willing to drink his bitter cup. Although he prayed, Father, let it pass from me. And I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels. From my hands pull the nails that torment me. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man that I call Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Then forever my soul would be lost. Now, I promised that I would turn that on. I'm glad to be here this morning, or as George Vern said, I'm glad to be anywhere uh, this morning at my age and all of the things that uh, has gone on with me. I'm not Chad, and uh, Chad's a little bit older than I am, so uh, that's not really a problem. But what I'm going to say must be important because my two children came all the way from New Orleans this morning in order to hear me so I can, uh, I'm like the guy who says after all of that, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize to you all this morning. I, uh, my cancer is back. Dr. Uh, Delry told me on uh, last Tuesday that my cancer's back. Uh, I'm sending the CT scan and the uh, PET scan to Dr. Delavicio at Ostner's in New Orleans. He's going to get with his uh, cohorts and with the surgeon and whatever and see if they can uh, do a biopsy to see what, uh, what's going on. And I appreciate your prayers, but I say that because I would love to hug all of your necks. I'd love to, to just... Uh, fellowship with you so much, but I can't take the, uh, well, it's not that my lack of faith is the fact that I don't want to tempt God with the uh, virus that's going around because dealing with both of them at the same time might be uh, something that would be a little bit uh, difficult for me. 
But I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to preach. I preached my first sermon in a army chapel in October of 1953. Now, if you're figuring that out right quick, that's 67 years ago, and the Lord has blessed me, and the Lord has promised me that I can die in the pulpit. Now, I don't know if it'll be this morning or <laughs> but wouldn't it be something if I killed over right now, uh, right in front of all of you. But I love to preach, and I'm more at home in the pulpit than I am anywhere else. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5, the Bible says that Ezra took up the word of God he stood on a pulpit of wood above all the people. And when he opened the book, the people all stood up. This morning I want to read a few verses from Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, since you're very, very close to it. And uh, as we uh, uh, read from God's word, I would like for you to stand with me if you would. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the, in the 20th century, or the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the, the citadel, or, or the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning uh, the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard that these words that I sat down and wept and mourned in many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you both my father's house and I have sinned. May we pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for this man, Nehemiah, who lived so many years ago, who was concerned about the people that he had left behind, even though he had never seen them. Lord, because... Uh, he was concerned about your work, and he did something about it. And help us, our Heavenly Father, in this day and time in which we live, that we may do what we can to try to remedy some of the problems that we face day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated? I love to study the book of Nehemiah. For several reasons. One is he saw God's will and he did it. He was not afraid to exert himself. He was not afraid to, to take a chance. He uh, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. He did some things that we can look at today that I think can help us because the day and time in which we live seems to be so near the day and time in which Nehemiah lived. Nehemiah was a high official, if you want to call it that. Uh, he was the king's cupbearer. Now, if you're interested in what the king's cupbearer was, he was the man who was right by the king if anything was brought in to the king for the king to eat, 
the cupbearer would eat of it first. If he went about his business, the king would eat it. If he keeled over, they'd know that somebody was trying to, to uh, kill the king and he wouldn't touch it. I wonder, do we do that today? Does somebody eat with, uh, with uh, what President Trump eats before he eats it? No, but he doesn't fix his own plate. The Secret Service fixes his plate of all of the stuff that's around, and you're not allowed to fix anything special for the president lest something happens uh, to him because there are some people around who would like to get rid of him. I'm sure uh, you uh, understand that. But Nehemiah was a friend of the king. The king was Artaxerxes, who was the son of Xerxes. And uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, many years before, had made a decree that the Jews could go back to their homeland whenever they were ready to. Now, you've got to remember that Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 B.C., there were three carrying aways of the Jews. Many of them had uh, set up businesses in this time. Many of them didn't want to go back, but many of them did. We're seeing a return of the Jews to, to, uh, to Israel in our day. I, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine one day many years ago Israel was reestablished in 1948. He said, you know, I thought that was symbolic. I didn't know that it was real. What the Bible says is real, and we need to understand that whatever the Bible says is going to happen is going to happen. It may not be the way we think it's going to, to, uh, to happen, but it's going to happen, and whatever God says is true, it will be true. So the, there were really three returnings of, of the Jews. And Nehemiah uh, asked Hananiah, one of the uh, brethren, what was going on in Jerusalem. And he told him what kind of a, a situation it was. Because the three carryings away, they carried away the best of the people. Then they came back and got the best of what was left. Then they came back and got the best of what was left. So they had the worst of the worst of the worst that was staying in Jerusalem. The people around them, there was Tobiah and there was Josiah and there was uh, some of the uh, uh, other people who really enjoyed what happened to Jerusalem. Do you realize that there are people who would like to see our nation destroyed today? They're doing their best. Several weeks ago, there was an article in the paper. I'm trying to remember the man's name that, uh, that wrote it. But I have kept it because it, it's not we are against this. It's we are against our country and we want to try to destroy it because the communists said they would destroy it from within many, many years ago, and we need to be, to, uh, to be um, aware of that. So when Nehemiah found out what was going on, there were several things that he did. Of course, he wept. Do you weep over the the condition of our nation today. Are you concerned about what is happening in our nation today? There are a lot of people who just sit back and say, oh, it'll work out. He was concerned. He wanted to know what was going on. The second thing he did was he prayed. Do you pray for our nation day by day? 
we need prayer in our nation today like never before. We've always needed prayer, but we need it today more than ever before. And thirdly, he did something about it. If you go to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, and I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And because the king could have had his head taken off, <laughs> uh, he had complete control over everything that he did, and uh, he, he could have taken care of everything. But what did he do? The Bible says that he prayed. And I said to the king, uh, I, therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad? And why are you not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became, fully, became, became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste and the gates are burned with fire? Then said, the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I prayed to the God of heaven. And then after he prayed, he went about to do something about it. The king gave him letters. He got cedars of Lebanon. He got uh, all of the uh, information that he needed. And folks, it's hard for us today to realize how the people traveled back in that day. Did you realize there were no McDonald's? There were no Burger Kings. There were no cell phones. Did you realize when I was born, we didn't even have dial telephones. We didn't have electricity until I was in high school. We used to meet Mr. Burl Rhymes twice a, day, twice a week and get ice and we'd bury it in a, um, a sawdust pile by the house and we'd have ice almost all the time but we'd go get a 50 or 100 pounds of ice and that sort of thing. Now we open the thing, get the ice out, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But they had to carry everything that they ate. They had to carry everything that they could do anything with. And it was all had to be prepared. They had no refrigeration, no anything like that. And it's hard for us to understand how difficult it was back in that day. But Nehemiah went back uh, to Jerusalem and he did several things. First of all, he got a few of his people. He took them at night. They went around the, the walls of, of, the, of the city. Now, I'll remind you that Nehemiah at one time was part of, es of Ezra. There was just one book of Ezra, and it's been uh, divided. That's why you have some of Ezra in here and some Nehemiah over in the book of, of Ezra. But he took these people around, and he surveyed the, um, the damage to the walls. Now, in those days, the walls were made out of stone. The gates were made out of wood. That's why he said that the walls were torn down and the gates were burned with fire. So he goes back and he gets the congregation together and he says, now, we're going to rebuild the wall. They said, what? We're going to rebuild the wall. That's an apostle. Yes. Well, wait, there's uh, Tobiah, Gershom. There's all of these people who are going to uh, oppose us if we do that. 
Nehemiah said, I'll tell you what we'll do. You take a sword in one hand and a trial in the other. Now, I understand the difficulty because I'm running out of ears. My glasses take up both my ears. This hearing aid takes up this ear. My cochlear implant takes up this ear over here, and then I try to put a mask on. But they took a sword in one hand and a, and a trowel in the other hand. They worked with this hand, and they were ready to defend what they were doing with the other hand. And they did the work, and God blessed them. And they worked in the, in the, uh, in the day, day after day, and Finally, when the, uh, let me get right over here. Um, when Tobiah saw that everything was going the way the Lord wanted them to go, what did he do? He says, let's meet. Bless me. Now, folks, let me tell you something. You can never compromise with the devil. He'll come out on time, on top, every time. I remember, what's the guy's name that just died that uh, the devil went down to Georgia and he was, had a, a, a fiddle of gold and he was trying to, to compromise with him. You can never compromise with the devil because he'll beat you every time. When I was growing up, to, to um, uh, what's the word I'm wanting? Since, since my stroke, I can't think of the, the exact word uh, that I want. But tolerate meant that you put up with something. What does it mean today? It means that you agree with me. And the devil uses words like that. I love uh, etymologists, the study of words. I love to study words. And uh, it's one of my, one of my hobbies. And uh, all of the things that we can do with semantics. But the devil can beat you every time because he's speaking one language and you're speaking another. To me and you, love means that we care for somebody. A communist can say, I love you, and shoot you at the same time because to the communist, love means whatever is good for the government, not whatever is good for you. And Nehemiah refused to compromise. Now, we have some preachers who have gone to jail already in our nation. It's going to get worse. I was reading the story the other day about a, a, a church and, and the mayor of the city had asked for a copy of his sermons. He said, I'm going to do it. Our freedom of religion is under attack today. The Bible is hate literature. When I was in school, we had chapel once a week, and we studied the Bible. Sometimes there's some interesting things. I took a, a course in Bible when I was in high school. It was the course that kept me from being valedictorian. I could have blamed God's word for it, but then I made a beeline. 
and I didn't like that. Now, you can't even carry it. When I taught at Forest Hill High School, I had a student that carried his Bible every day. It was on top of his Bible. I said, God bless you. God bless you. Take care of you. To them I built the walls. He went back as he had promised our Xerxes that he would. He went back to uh, to Shushan the palace and he served the king and then he asked the king if he could go back and guess what he found? Old Tobiah who had opposed him so much was living in the temple. Now, can you imagine that? Nehemiah had left Elisha in charge, and he befriended uh, Tobiah and and uh, some of the others, and he put it, made him a place in the temple. And I, this is something I would love. I, I guess I'm a little um, uh, bad in, in this. But I would have loved to have been standing and watching what Nehemiah did when he came back and he found out that the Bible was living in the temple. He didn't talk to Eliab. Eliab. He didn't talk to anybody else. He went in, and I could imagine him standing out there, and here came a couch, shoom. Here came a chair, shoom. Here came a bookcase, shoom. He threw all of the stuff out of the Bible, out of the, the temple. If we are not carried, careful, the world will get into our churches today, and we won't know what's happened. Do you think that we would ever see a time when there would be homosexual preachers, homosexual members, homosexuals, everything else, that we would have men marrying men and women marrying women and all of those sorts of things that the Bible says in an abomination that we would have it in our churches? It is so ridiculous when you stop and you think about it. But if we are not on our guard every minute, the devil can come in and the first thing you know, he's in control. He doesn't want to be tolerated. He wants to control. Now, we as preachers today can't do what Nehemiah did. If you go to Nehemiah chapter uh, 13, I want you to to read just a little bit of what he did. Start with verse 11. So I contended or I struggled with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Do you realize back in that day they paid the choir? I don't know but one church choir in the United States that has paid members. How many of you know what it is? The Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Why can they pay choir members? Because if you live in the state of Utah, the government holds out 10% of your salary. 
If you are a Mormon, it is given to the church. If you're not a Mormon, it's given back to the people uh, who earned it. If we did what God told us, tells us to do, it's amazing what we could do as God's people. It's amazing. Then all Jerusalem brought the tithe of grain and the new wine and the oil of the storehouse, and I appointed treasurers over the storehouse, Chilamiah the priest, that I could scribe, and of the Levites, Padai, and next to them was Hannah, the son of Zuchar, the son of Mathanai, and they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds which I have done in the house of my God. But to make a, a longer story short, he separated the people who had married into uh, the pagan uh, people, he, he uh, separated them. He says, somehow I pulled out their hair. He was a violent type of person because he was concerned about what God was doing among his people. Or maybe been more of what God was not doing among his people. And he set everybody in their places. And the book ends by saying, so I struggled, beginning verse 25, so I can struggled with them and cursed them, struck some of them, pulled out their hair, made them swear, swear to God by saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons and are take their daughters to your sons for of your, or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. The wisest man who ever lived. Was taken down by sin. The strongest man that ever lived. Was taken down by sin. If we are not careful. Sin can take us down. And we need to be very, very careful of it. Should we then hear of your doing all of this great evil, transgressing against God by marrying pagan women? And one of the sons of Jediah, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Sanballat was one of those that opposed uh, Nehemiah building the wall. Therefore, I drove him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits appointed times. Remember me, O oh my God. What does this tell us? Number one, we need to be concerned. I hear the morning news, the noon news, and the evening news. I have a pretty good idea of what's going on in our nation. We need to know what's going on. Secondly, we need to be concerned. There are some people who say, oh, well, it didn't affect me. Now, I don't know how you stand on this, but I'll tell you that we just let in or, or, or gave in to blackmail on our flag. Because somebody says, we're not going to come to your house if you don't do what we want you to do. 
Well, I'm sorry. My house is my house. You come to my house if you want to. You don't have to. We need to be concerned. We need to pray to God. Prayer is the greatest force that there can be. I had stage four cancer when I went back to Bluff Springs Baptist Church. Johnny Smith stood up and he says, there sits a miracle. I almost died. Of course, I wouldn't have been better off if I had. <laughs> but prayer can do Great things. Do you realize that prayer made the sun stand still? Do you realize that prayer made the sun go back? Prayer can do the same things today that it did back in the days of Joshua, Moses, and and. Um, and Hezekiah, prayer can do the same thing today if we pray honestly. And then we need to let people know who we are. I was pastoring a church in North Mississippi. I was visiting a lady one day and she was crying. Oh, they took my little boy into the army and they ruined him. I said, no, they didn't. I spent three years in the army. It didn't change me at all. I have never drank a, a, an ounce or a drop of alcohol. I've never smoked. I've never done a lot of the things that people do. But the thing is, when people get away from the pressures of home, what they really are comes out. Think about that a few minutes. I said, ma'am, your son is the same today as he was when he left. You just didn't see him as he is. We need to be genuine people. We need to be people that God can use But first of all, we have to be Christians. We have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've got to put our faith and our trust in him. If you don't belong to God, he doesn't hear a prayer that you pray. I heard one time that they were re repairing the church. They were remodeling the church. And when they took the roof off was all the prayers they just they didn't get the because the people did not have faith. And you can pray all day long, but if you don't believe belong to Christ. He listens to his children. The second thing is we need to profess him as Lord and Savior of our life. We need to be baptized. Jesus came to the Jordan River and told John, he said, I want you to baptize me. Oh, no. no. He said, no. To fulfill all righteousness. And then we have to become new people. We can't make ourselves new people. We can't make ourselves anything, but God can make us everything. If we give our lives and, and our service to him, it's amazing 
what he can do with you and with me. If you're not here this morning and you're not a Christian, I would encourage you, put your faith in Christ. Give him your life. He brought you into the world. He can do whatever he wants to. I made a statement a while ago. Millard Pearl was my fourth cousin. Isn't that interesting? Anyhow, my granddaddy and his mother were brother and sister. Anyhow, he loved to bird hunt. He was a preacher. He gave his heart to Jesus in a foxhole in World War II. He loved to bird hunt. He died bird hunting. I said, Lord, you know there's one thing in this life that I love to do. I love to preach. If you can let Millard Pearl die bird hunting, you can let me die in the future. I don't know if he's going to do this. That's in his will or not. I'm not going to push him. Whatever happens to me is in God's hands and I'll thank him for it, whatever it is, and you can do the same thing. We're going to have a time of invitation. Our accompanists are going to come and play. And we will just watch them. That's what the program said. I want you to bow your head right where you are. If you would give your heart to Jesus, I would encourage you to stand up where you are, to come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you would give your heart and your life to him.